Hi, I'm Jalen Rose, and welcome to the Renaissance Man podcast, proudly presented by the New York Post, a show where we cover trends in fashion, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. My next guest is a dynamic actor, producer, and director who stars as the fan favorite Malik Wright in the beloved series, The Game, which is currently airing in its second season on Paramount Plus, but there's more. He's also mm. playing a major role in normalizing the conversation around mental health, especially for men, those in the black community, as well as the sports community. It is my honor to welcome the uber talented Hosea Chanchez to the <laughs> Renaissance Man podcast. What up, family? Thank you, my brother. Thank Man, that was one hell of a intro. I appreciate you so much for all that. Thank you. Absolutely, and well deserved. So you're a Montgomery, Alabama native. Yes, also sir, Montgomery, Alabama. Raised in Atlanta, spent a lot of time there. So tell me about your childhood. So as you said, my childhood, I started in Montgomery, Alabama. I was born on a, a Maxwell Air Force Base. And my mom had me around 16, 17 years old. And the short of the long is my grandparents were really the, the pillars in my life. They, they raised me both sets of my grand, grandparents, my mom's mom and my father's father and mother. So in a sense, they are like my parents. Um, and I moved to California when I was about 17, 18 years old, dropped out of school. Um, uh, and the rest is kind of history from homeless to where I am today. <laughs> I've used this term so many times about my late mother and how much her influence and my grandmother's mm. influence. Those are my bodyguards, my angels on, on earth. Yes. So what was it like for you as a young man trying to navigate with a teenage mom? Mm. Well, I'll tell you this, man. Uh, my mother has always done the best that she could in my life. I don't have one regret for the way things happen for me in my circumstances. My mom is the hardest working woman I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, and she's about four foot nine or somewhere. She's a really tiny woman. Um, but she's one of the most hardworking people and humans I've ever encountered in my life. And she never takes no for an answer. So a lot of my, eth my, my ethics and how I navigate the world without accepting no for answers, it comes from my mom. Now, a lot of who I've become as a, a caring man and a giving man and a loving man um, with God at the center and the forefront of everything that exists yeah. in my life com comes from my grandparents. Um, my grandparents instilled in me what they gave to my parents and my uncles and aunties. Um, so in a sense, me and my mom kind of grew up together because mm -hmm. she was learning about life. As you know, at that age, she was still learning about life uh, when she had me. So uh, I don't have any regrets. And one of the catalysts to who I am today and how I got to Hollywood is because at 17, my grandmother died. Um, and this was my everything. My grandmother passed. So um, that was when I knew I had nothing to lose. And I had another angel on my shoulder to yeah. actually push me out to Hollywood at such a young age. I don't even today. I'm like, how in the hell did you pack up your little Mitsubishi clips with your vacuum and your TV and your clothes and <laughs> drive across country uh, with my cousin at the time who didn't drive a stick shift and my car was a stick shift. And <laughs> literally, I have no idea where I got the, the balls, so to speak, from. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was because I had my grandmother on my side and I had already lost the worst thing that could have happened to me at that age. So I had nothing to lose. You have to tell so us a little bit how I, where I came from and how I got here. No doubt. So you're clearly fearless and you're also someone when you believe that you can try to make something happen, you're not going to just talk about it. You're going to get in your Mitsubishi, use the stick shift, <laughs> drive across the country. So make tell it about that drive tell me about the music you were listening to tell me about how many times you stopped tell me about <laughs> how you navigated it once you got to your destination wow so if i'm not mistaken uh 
with my cousin Errol and I, who was like my brother, my aunt, because uh, I, for the first 13 years of my life, I was an only child. Um, when I was 13, my mom had my younger brother. And then uh, when I was 12, I'm sorry, my father had my other younger brother. So I was a big brother. But for the most of my young life, I'd grown up uh, under my cousin's wings, all of them, every last one of them. Um, and so my cousin, Errol, he didn't drive a stick shift and he uh, was determined to go with me. Thank God he did, because after we got to California, it was a whole nother life than we envisioned. But uh, I would listen. I would get us on the freeway because he couldn't go up on ramps because <laughs> he couldn't drive a stick. I would get us on the freeway, Jalen. And once I got us on the freeway, we would do a body switch. I would cross <laughs> under, he would go over. And you're talking about wow. a Mitsubishi Eclipse, man. So, you know, it's a tiny car. <laughs> wow. And so I would get it in the fifth gear and he could take it from there. And most of our drive, as you know, you know, most of our drive is just endless freeway. Texas was, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest part of our drive. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was a diehard Biggie, Tupac, and Snoop Dogg fan. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, and boys to men and Brandy out of all Stop. people in the world, the irony that Brandy and I will become some of the best friends in the world. Um, and Brandy, like those were the four things that I know, the four albums that we listen to consistently, boys to men, Brandy, um, Snoop, uh, Dre always and Biggie and Tupac. <laughs> so that was the playlist. <laughs> so that's your definite all time playlist. And it clearly meant, the world to you because at some point you made it to California. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when you got to California, you didn't have no apartment waiting on you. Listen, I was supposed to stay with a relative and I have to be 100% honest and authentic to my story. I was supposed to stay with one of my relatives and that fell through. And she told me in Texas that mm. I couldn't stay. I couldn't stay with her. I'll, I'll keep the reason, you know, to myself she but didn't believe you was coming first and foremost she did not believe i was coming <laughs> however i was determined to get here and so once i got here she had set me up with a friend of hers who i could stay with for a couple of weeks well you know hey just as, as life always throws you a curveball and, and especially anytime when you're on you're on your track and on your destiny and you're aiming towards the goal that god has you and the plans you and god have there's going to be some curveballs. So um, the place that I was supposed to stay at, I ended up staying one night with this with this young lady, and I had no idea that she was on drugs and was dating her drug dealer. Oh well, oh. well. The first night, my cousin Errol and I had gotten to California, which we were out in Riverside, and all I thought about was I just needed to be in California to be an actor. I thought I was in Hollywood. I thought it was all the same. You know, I thought it was just one place. Well, I was in Riverside, damn it. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and so her that night after we had gotten all of our stuff in uh, the house, I'm sorry, it was the second night this happened, I'm about to tell you. So we got all our stuff, my stuff out of the car, unpacked all my things. And my cousin was supposed to leave maybe three days after on a, uh, on a uh, Greyhound bus back home. Mm -hmm. And so we got all, our, all, all of my stuff in our house to keep it safe and everything. And we got it in the house and the next day, the drug dealer boyfriend um, kicked the door down, stole all my stuff. No. And I mean, everything but the vacuum cleaner, the dirt devil, the red <laughs> dirt devil vacuum cleaner. He stole all of my stuff oh. and forbid me to come back to the house. I had no idea she was on drugs. Um, and the rest of the cash that I had, I think I had about 1200 bucks. She stole, luckily I'd hidden um, I think I'd hidden 700 bucks and kept 500 with me for whatever reason. And so she stole that money. He stole all my stuff. And so I ended up homeless and having to stay in my car um, for, yeah, man, in the Walmart parking lot in Riverside up under the light so I could be seen. And the security guard who did the rounds watched me. What We have to talk more about this. Yeah. Yeah. So you in Riverside, California, living in your car underneath a Walmart, mm -hmm. using the light as security. 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 Mm -hmm. That's right. Talk to me about those days. And the, I don't mean to get too graphic, but how were you going about eating? How were you going about using the bathroom? Like, what were your days like? 
So there was a, I think it was a YMCA or something similar to a YMCA in out in Riverside. I was showered there um, and I, it's crazy getting emotional about this story, but I was showered there and, um, and then I would eat as minimal as I possibly could. So I wouldn't have to use the bathroom, go into the store, use the bathroom. Cause at that time they weren't allowing you to just use the bathroom. And I, I still don't think they do, but you had to buy something. So I wasn't going to buy something every time I needed to pee and poop. So <laughs> um, I would eat uh, at this place called Checkers that would give you two burgers for a dollar. And that would stretch me out um, for like breakfast and dinner. And then Taco Bell, just fast food, you know, specials, anywhere I could get a special for a dollar. Um, and then I discovered this place called Jack in the Box, which we didn't have in the South. So uh, I'd eat like two tacos or something like that for a dollar. So anything, anywhere I could stretch my money out. <laughs> Yeah, and eventually I found a, a a church that I wanted to go to that, you know, because I was, well, I was lying to my family, first of all, telling them that I had a place to live. Because I knew my mom was going to be like, get your ass in your car and bring your ass back home. Oh, so I'm coming out there to get you. Mm -hmm. They never would have let me stay had I not let them know or I, had I had they known that I didn't have a place to live. And so I, went, I kept that act up for a while. I think even... Uh, you know, my my relatives that I was supposed to stay with here, somehow it was a secret to my mom for a long time. And so I ended up finding uh, a family that took me in and allowed me to stay with them. Wow. And then this is like maybe a month later um, or maybe a little bit more. Actually, my cousin thinks it was more than that. But I, you know, sometimes with trauma in your life, you can collapse time or you can forget those things. So yeah, that was really my daily life. I'd shower at a thing like, a, it was like a YMCA. Um, and then I would eat, you know, the cheapest food I possibly could. And then I would go look for jobs. The first job that I got here, uh, my uncle that lived out here at the time, he was a car salesman. So I was like, let me try my hand at being a car salesman. Uh, Cause I knew I could possibly make a lot of money. And I felt like I was a pretty good salesman because I had had a lot of jobs in my life up until that point mm -hmm. back home in Alabama. So yeah, that's kind of how that portion of the story went. So clearly if you're homeless living in a different state that you drove across country in a lot of ways, believing in your faith one first and foremost, also having the courage of your convictions, not to share with your family back home about the reality of your struggle. Talk to me about what that did to your psychological and mental health. You know, I wish in some ways that I could tell you that it did something very damaging to me. However, it was the fuel in my fire. I used it. Um, my grandmother, as I said, had passed away. And that was the reason why I felt like I could move to California. Because the worst thing that could ever happen to me had already happened. I mean, my grandmother was my everything. And so I knew if I could get beyond this hump that I would be okay. I used it as fuel in my life. Um, I've always been a man who's been very close to God. I've always had a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And I've always known and believed that all your trials and tribulations, I believe in my core that God uses everything. Yes. Um, and that's not perfect oftentimes. So I knew if I could get beyond living in my car, then I would be limitless. And I, I couldn't be unstoppable in so many ways. However, that doesn't mean that it didn't come with the share of challenges because there are a lot of times where I was scared, man. I was afraid because I hadn't been away from home. I'd always had the comfort of, you know, my cousins, my big cousins, anytime that anything came up in my life or I was threatened, you know, they were always there for me. So being on my own uh, in and of itself uh, was traumatic because I was so used to being around my family. Um, but I, I believe it made me a better man. I believe it made me a stronger man. And it prepared me for the journey that I had ahead, ahead of me, which was not an easy journey. Um, believe it or not, I've been through some things that living in my car was like, shit, that was a piece of cake. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. right. So, so um, wow. yeah, I think that I use those things as fuel and determination. And to be honest with you, 
um, at that time, I was using a lot of the negatives as we do when we're younger. I used the the no. negatives to fuel me because I was going to prove them wrong. You know what I mean? No, no, no. Um, yeah. And I mean, you no longer have to do that once you become, you know, into yourself and, and, and secure within yourself and God, you don't need negatives to, to, to advance you in life. But at that time I did. So I think they helped push me forward, to be honest with you. And at some point there was a human being that help changed your life mm -hmm. and you give me the moment where you were living in your car but you felt my goal to be an actor and an entertainer can actually happen because this took place so there is one pivotal moment that i've never i don't think i've ever discussed this with anybody so there's one pivotal moment that happened to me and that was the day i went to get a haircut i went into this barber shop to get my hair cut uh, for a job interview that I had like that Monday, I went on a Friday. And in that barbershop was a man who literally held my hand and changed the trajectory of my entire life. And his name is Jerome. And mm -hmm. I was in the Inland Empire. Um, and I walked into this barbershop and Jerome was a man who had taken in, I mean, he was an angel. He is an angel because he ain't gone. Jerome is an angel. And this man single-handedly took me under his wing. He, wow. at that time, was a foster parent to other people. So he, he, he could sniff the, all of the living in my car and the, all mm -hmm. the, the that I was trying to hide and walk into and, you know, make people think, because nobody wants to walk around with being homeless on okay. their shoulders. No he knew it. Somehow he knew it. I know now that that was the grace of God is the reason why he knew it. But he knew that, I didn't have a place to live because he kept drilling me about specific questions. Lo and behold, this man had ties to Hollywood and mm -hmm. he was a part of the reason why I was able to get to where I needed to be. Um, because Jerome uh, took me under his wing, allowed me to have a place to live. He invited me into his home and into his church home and into his family. And because of that, I am where I am today incredible and you were 24 years of age now this is after dropping out of school living in your mm -hmm. car now you're 24 years of age and you land the role of malik what was it man, like oh man getting the call for this role and when did you realize that the show was going to be special i didn't realize that it was going to be special because honestly um the story about Malik, it, I did not audition for Malik initially. I auditioned for Derwin. Mm. And it was at the time where UPN and the WB were collapsing into this thing that we know today called the CW. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me. They were collapsing into this thing called the CW. So I'd auditioned on UPN and WB for Derwin. And in the time, I think I'd auditioned and tested and it was about maybe six weeks. It was the longest process. And I had tested for shows and stuff before. And I had, um, at that time, had been semi-successful. I'm saying semi to be light, but I got to give God his due. I was really successful in, um, uh-oh, sorry. I was really successful in commercials at that time. And so um, I was going in the rat, I was in the rat race with Derwin Heavy. Mm. And I didn't get that part. And then I tested again once the CW, it was about three weeks of a changeover, maybe four, somewhere in there, the changeover from UPN and WB uh, becoming the CW and they wanted our show. And uh, Mara and Celine brought me back in. They wanted to see me, the casting director called and said, well, the producers want to see you for another role because you didn't get that role. They still think that you're perfect for this one. They had cast Wendy. Wendy was the very first person cast on the show. As a matter of fact, the role of Tasha Matt was actually written for Wendy. And so they were looking for somebody who not only resembled Wendy, but who could handle this character opposite her. And so I turned it down the first time. I was like, I ain't gonna do that. I'm too, I was too sore and too, you know, raw from the audition of uh, Derwin and disappointed from going from, you know, network to net. And I was the only person that had traveled um, in testing from, you know, UPN, WB, CW. So I was like, I'm getting this job. I just knew that that, that role was mine. But instead it went to a, uh, this phenomenal actor called, his name is Aldous Hodge. And 
um, which is before Pooch. And so Aldis had gotten it. And Aldis and I had been, Aldis, me and Pooch, actually, we known each other heavily, heavily on the, uh, on the commercial circuit. And so I was really happy for him, but I knew it wasn't something that I really wanted to go back through. And so the casting director called me, Suzanne got a smite, and she said, the producers really want to see for this role. They called me twice. I turned it down the first time and then I prayed about it. I was like, God, you know, is this something I should do? And literally it was like a voice came down from the sky. It was like, you don't get to determine when you quit. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> and get your ass up because if you never go down to the lobby at a hotel you got to meet God somewhere so I had to do the work in order to you know for something to 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 happen in my life and in my career so I dusted my emotions off dusted my my hurt feelings off and disappointment more than anything and went and landed the role of Malik so and that's now, how wow yeah that is crazy now I'm gonna tell you too I, and I don't mean to cut you off, but this is also a testament to surrendering in your life to something bigger. Right. Yes. And and not always needing to have the last or the first word in your life, allowing something that you feel to get out of your own way. Because had I gotten the role of Derwin, I I I wouldn't be where I am today. And I don't know if I would have, you know, I've done something greater or whatever. I have no idea. But I know for a fact that this is not where I would be today. Um, yeah, so thankfully being obedient and um, ha not having a perfect journey, much like the start of my life here in, um, in California, not having that perfect journey allowed me to have the fruits of my labor and of my life and my dreams actually come true in a way that I never imagined that they would. And let's acknowledge some of those fruits, NCIS. Mm -hmm girlfriends, major crimes, black lightning, all American. And that's just for TV, y'all. Dysfunctional friends. Let the church say amen. Down for whatever. Fanatic. When you now look back at your career, and by the way, the sky's the limit. You're just getting started. Mm -hmm. What is it like for you having that discography behind you the future in front of you when you're filming the game 20 years later. What's different about filming the show now as opposed to when you first started? You know what? Listen, I say this and I really do mean this. I'm in my 40s now. I'm a 40-year-old man or 42-year-old man now. And this is the best time in my career and in my life. Mm. I am in... Uh, I'm in a space now that I'm co-creating with God. I'm not in my own way as I've been in the past, as you try to push to, to gain who you are and to become you know, the type of man, the type of human, uh, and the type of artist that you wanna be. There's so much uh, force in that you know, as, as we're younger men. Yes. And now I'm in a sweet spot where I actually can do the things that I've always wanted to do, although it doesn't look like I thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually living my dream. Jalen, my dream was always just to be a working actor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to make a, a career out of this thing and to be able to pay my bills and to contribute to my family's life and to my own life and build a life for myself. And that's thankfully where I am today. And had I been orchestrating this, I never would have ended up where I am. And I never would have done it uh, the way that God did it. Because I, I strongly believe that these aren't necessarily my choices. However, uh, the 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 day to day choices aren't mine, but the overall uh, the overall thing that circum that that encompasses my career is everything I've ever dreamt of. So, getting out of my own way. Now, the other part of that is I've learned so much along the way about myself through this business. Uh, mm -hmm. through through the no's and the rejections and the having to go deep because I never wanted to be, my, my father was and is an, an addict um, his entire, my entire life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that held me together as a human and as a man of God and as a man in general and as a black man specifically was the ideals that I just didn't want to do and make the same choices that my father did. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad is a very good man. He's an awesome human being. But I got to see someone 
who didn't want to do the things that he did that didn't have any control over his being and of his man. Mm -hmm. um, so I always wanted to, to put good out into the world and never have any of the attachments that would steer me from the course that God has me on. Mm -hmm. So now I'm really kind of enjoying uh, the fruits of my labor, as I said earlier, now because I'm not resisting my life anymore. I'm one with God, or I'm partnering yes. um, with God and I'm surrendering to whatever he brings my way, which isn't always or often what I want or what I think it would be. So I hope I answered your question. I know I was long. Yeah, no, I definitely <laughs> think that I'm a man of faith also. And I admire your character, your maturity. And as I acknowledge, in addition to tackling mental health as your character, Malik, you're also taking it a step further with a new project yes. called The Good Fellas. The Good Fellas. Show by yes. Black men for, for everyone. everyone. When mm. did you realize that mental health was something that you wanted to talk about publicly and do a project about? So in 2019, I'd actually written a play. I wrote a play because I remembered something that I'd forgotten about myself and that I was molested at a really young age by a man, by my friend's father at that time. And I'd forgotten it. I'd put it completely out of my mind um, intentionally. And I looked up and 20 something years later, you know, almost 30 something years later, I realized that this, I re-realized that this had actually happened to me mm. and it hit me like a ton of bricks. It sent me in a depression. It sent me in a tailspin. I um, probably felt the least amount human once I re-realized it. Um, and so I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know what to do with it. You know, how do I hold this person accountable and how do I hold myself accountable to the things that I intentionally forgot? And so what I did was I wrote an, an op-ed or, you know, I just a, a journal, an open journal, whatever you would like to call it. Mm. I wrote about that and I channeled that into a, a, a one-man show uh, called Good Morning. Mm. And once I did that, I started to uncover a lot of different things about myself that led to some of the things I wasn't happy about with myself as a man. And in that, I could finally get some work done. I could finally uh, heal some of the things that I felt that I needed to um, have a resolve to and put to bed with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so that was in 2019. Cut to um, a year and a half ago, season one of this iteration of the game on Paramount Plus. My executive producer and showrunner, Devon Gregory, wrote a... Uh, a really strong plot point for my character. And that was Malik was dealing with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do, Jalen, I had to unpack all mm -hmm. of those things that in order, because I knew that I wanted to play Malik in his, his most authentic way. And I knew I couldn't play him the way I played him in the past. And the way I played him in the past was just as an actor um, and not necessarily having enough life experience to give to him at the same points that I was at and that he was at. Um, Cause at that point, when Malik was, when we were on uh, BET and even on CW, I hadn't had much of life experience because I was just in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I was going to have to dig deep in order to bring some authenticity to Malik. And I really wanted to. And so that made me start to unpack the same traumas that I'd experienced before the pandemic even started and the traumas that I experienced. And most of us experienced traumas through the pandemic. So I had to dig in and I had to do some work in myself in order to, to, to bring uh, some realness to Malik and what he was going through. That uncovered a lot more stuff for me as a human and as a man and on my journey and on my walk. And one of the things that I learned was that I have and that humans in general, we have the ability to block things out. And that messed with me big time, bro. Like mm -hmm. being able to be in this body, in this mind, with this heart space, that I have in this connection to God, I just didn't understand how I could forget something that happened that was so traumatic to me. Mm -hmm. Well, then I learned, well, that's why you forgot it. It was intentional. And a lot of people that suffer through uh, being molested at a young age, they too, uh, you know, intentionally forget these things. So mm -hmm. another cut to um, recently, 
I, the last year, humanity, and 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 black men in particular, um, the past five years, but the past year with the amount of uh, police brutality, the amount of deaths, the amount of um, our culture just experienced some things that are coping mechanisms in most instances um, mm-hmm. that are damaging to our communities. I felt that there was a void. Also, I'm, I will say this. Um, we as a people, as a human race, have done a really good job with other um, with other areas of life, with women. We needed to do the work to help women in general and to get out of this archaic space that we had uh that we had our, our, our women in. Um, we've done work in the gay and transgender, uh, um, gay and transgender communities. And I looked up last year and I realized that there was a deficit. There was a huge deficit for black men um, because there was no outlet. There were some things and some series of events that I'd experienced. And like, a, like I said, a lot of us experienced going through COVID. And I looked up and I didn't have a place to heal. Um, I'd written that play, as I told you, and that was a way for me to try to heal from the traumas of losing my grandmother at a young age, being molested at a young age, and not having some of the things that I felt that I needed on my journey, my life journey. And so last year, I looked up and I felt like, okay, well, I'm not going to write another one man show right now, but where do I go to heal? Um, And everywhere I looked, there was not really a place for us as Black men to express our traumas and to explore and unpack those things that we had gone through, there was no community. Um, And so the best way for me as an artist to do something about that deficit is to create the space for us to have that. Um, And a lot of it was my own selfish reasons, but the majority of it was to allow Black men to feel um, heard and to feel seen. Because as I said, the past five, five to six years or so, we've done so much work with other communities and other pockets of our society, but we can't forget about the pillars of our society. We can't forget about our brothers, our fathers, our friends, our sons, you know, and particularly for me, I think everybody should take part and do whatever they can in their communities. But particularly for me, it's a very specific thing and it's black men in general. So I wanted to dive in um, and create that space for us to talk about our traumas and not have any repercussions or feeling that uh, we will lose something because we are honest with ourselves. Because one thing I know, we can talk about this even more specifically, Jalen, but one thing we know is when you get Black men having a conversation, if we can just have a talk about what we're experiencing, you experience healing and mm-hmm. Even even a secondary healing by way of someone else expressing what it is, if you don't become um, communicative and engaging in that conversation, what it does is it mentally gives you a piece of solitude, especially for a guy like myself and a character uh, like Malik, who is so, uh, what do you call it? He, he's such a, uh, a masculine figure. You know, he's so chauvinistic in so many ways. Um, I knew that if I could uh, uncover and take off my veil, and show the humanity of who I am, that it would lead to a lot of change for a lot of my brothers out there who are suffering right now and don't have the outlets and can't go to therapy and can't talk to their wives or their children or their mothers about what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. I knew that this would start and spark a conversation in our community that would allow some brothers, if not all brothers that experience this type of show to heal from it. And that's why shows like The Goodfellas are so very important. That's why characters like Malik are so very important because as you mentioned, few and far between where we get the outlet to express our true selves and Mm -hmm. be vulnerable in our masculinity. So I have Mm -hmm. to ask you whether it's play, TV, movie, when you were writing yours, you clearly had some that inspired you. Mm-hmm. So possible, can you name five shows that inspired you to write your play and or Goodfellas? Ooh, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. A lot of the inspiration that I've gotten today has come from all the women in my life, um, particularly women of color who have gone through a wealth of things, who there's just one, there's something about 
encountering a black woman who by nature is mothering, who by nature, everything that you've been through is not, um, is not demonized, it's humanized. Um, and I don't know, to be honest with you, I, I followed, I think a lot of the same people that a lot of us do. I mean, you know, your Oprah's and your, your, your Anla's. And um, I haven't met a lot of men who have been vulnerable enough in an instant to, to I mean, I love Steve Harvey, um, but I, I have more people than shows. I don't have a lot of shows, to be honest with you. I mean, I love the shop, actually. I uh, admire what um, LeBron and the team over there have done with engaging with men and having a conversation about uh, their experiences, our experiences, and community experiences in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have more people than, than shows. <laughs> that totally makes sense. And that's why I ask you the question because it reminds us that they're very few and far between. And mm. it's only right that you would like a show like The Shop because being in the barbershop, like so many of us, changed mm -hmm. your life. That's right. And so before I let you get out of here That's and I right. appreciate you taking the time, I have a rapid fire segment called oh. God in 60 Seconds. You okay. ready to this? Name uh, an actor. So. That, the, name an actor that you have not worked with, that you hope to work with. Denzel Washington. I see you got a masterful piece of art over your shoulder. So mm -hmm. I have to ask you, who's your favorite artist? Ooh. Well, <laughs> I have a couple. I have quite a few actually, but this piece behind me is this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant brother, and his name is Kajal Beans. And as I was entering into the art space about 15 years ago, he's one of the, the few artists that would allow me into his studio. Mm. And yeah, and he's now gone on to do some unbelievable things and, and has now raised his bar and become uh, one of those artists that wants to watch. And so I'm really proud of him, his development and uh, his hand and his love for his people. Um, I've always been connected to the art that represents me. Um, although I believe you should own whatever moves you. Uh, Kajal is one of my absolute favorites. And then Kahende Wiley, who famously painted the president, President Barack Obama's um, painting that's in uh, wherever it is, Smithsonian, wherever it is. Um, he also inspires me, not just because of his talent, but also because of his, he has an undeniable sense of leadership in our communities. He is a blackity, black, 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 bliggity, black man who <laughs> believes in teaching other black talent how to use their gifts. So he is somebody that I am so inspired by, um, him and his work. So let's talk food. You've been yes. all over. You talk to me about your journey of driving across country. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> in, in life? Okay. Yes. Uh, What's your favorite see, I'm restaurant? A food, I'm, a, I'm a foodie, man. So uh, I have it broken up into uh, food types. <laughs> I love it. Let's go. <laughs> so Chinese food, I'll start no, with no, my me favorite too. food. <laughs> yeah, shrimp egg blue young patties all day. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, Chinese food is my ultimate favorite food. Um, and then Japanese after. But um, there was this place that used to, well, uh, I'll start with the place that I love most. I just left New York. And every time I go to New York, when I get off the plane, there is this place. It's a little bougie, but I'm telling you, it is in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I went to New York, I was on a quest to find the best Chinese food because everybody talked about how the Chinese food is supposed to be so good. Also, Jamaican food in New York. However, um, there's this place called Tang Pavilion that was introduced to me. Uh, in the late 2000s, early 2000s. And that is my absolute favorite Chinese food. And then there was a place here in LA that disappeared called Yee's. It was Hood. Have you ever, <laughs> did you ever go to Yee's? No, you heard of Yee's? no, no that's why I'm asking. Cause when you give me these recommendations, I'm going. You're going to check them out. Listen, Yee's was, it was a hood staple. <laughs> they got closed down for uh, 
some reasons that we ain't gonna discuss. <laughs> right, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> However, However, it was some of the best Chinese food I'd ever had uh, in, in in LA. And Japanese food, I love sushi and uh, all things Japanese, all things Asian when it comes to food. That's just what my palate really, really loved. Um, and then Jamaican food in New York, there was a, a place in, in New York called Mom's that was in the hood. And um, that too is no longer around, but Mom's was a really awesome hole in the wall Jamaican food place. And uh, yeah, so I had to travel to get my favorites, but yeah, so Asian and then Jamaican and then soul food is always near and dear to my heart because of, you know, I grew up in the South in Montgomery, Alabama. So that's what my family cooked. That's our food. That's our culture. So anytime I want to feel a taste of home, you know, some collard greens and some yeah. cornbread and some, yes. well, fried chicken in the past, but, you know, fried fish or something like that is yes. really what excites me the most. Dope, dope. And last, but certainly not least. And again, I appreciate you taking your time, your energy, your honesty, your candor. You're you, playing an actor that's an athlete on the game. Yes. Athlete that's currently playing. Do you feel like could make the best actor? Ooh. You know what? I think that someone, Kyrie Irving, and I say that. Great answer. Great absolutely. answer. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I say that because I believe the best actors have depth. I believe they think outside the box, despite whatever anybody believes. That's why I gave you the answer of Denzel Washington, because Denzel Washington is a maverick and a, a free thinker, despite what people might believe. I've studied him in his tape, <laughs> like a sport. And he is unapologetically himself. He's yes. absolutely raw in who he is. And he he does not compromise who he is, no matter what. No. I remember when Denzel, um, quickly, some years back, I remembered him being interviewed and he said in this interview that he would not kiss a white woman. Mm -hmm. And he was actually at the time, he was in a movie or something, I think with Julia Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for me, for the, for, the, for the life of me, I was like, how in the hell is he able to say that? And, <laughs> you know, in the client, I mean, think about it in the early 2000s, no. 90s, whenever yeah. that was, I'm like, you got to be, you ain't just a man. You got to, you know, you, you're not conforming to this thing that we all conform to in some type of way. Yep. Some way he's free. Yep. And despite what, whether you agree or I agree with everything he says has nothing to do with the reason why I think Kyrie and uh, Denzel um, are kind of in that same box is because, listen, despite whether I agree with you or not, I am one with any man who can live in this environment, in this business no that doubt. is not by us and not always for us who mm. can stand in the truth of who he is, despite sitting mm -hmm. next to Julia Roberts and saying, <laughs> me and my wife decided I'm not kissing a white woman on camera for no. whatever his convictions were at the time. But my point is he has conviction. So I believe ultimately somebody like a Kyrie Irving could probably make a really great actor because, you know, living in your convictions outside of this business can also really help you uh, develop a great skill set to navigate this business. So I think you kind of need that in today's time to, to be a really good actor. And those are the people I generally gravitate to are people who uh, stand outside of the norm or conforming to the norm. Well, terrific, my brother. Again, I appreciate you taking the time. Looking forward to supporting all of your projects. You Thank are you, here killing them. You're going to keep doing your thing. Hosea Chanchez. I appreciate yeah. you, my brother. Looking forward to breaking bread soon. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you so much. God bless you and your family. You too, brother. God Thank you. Me. Thank you.